Attention. It's time to register for Elusian Live 2024, April 7th through 10th in San Antonio, Texas. Illuminate, innovate, inspire, explore higher education's greatest opportunities with future ready ideas, solutions, and best practices designed to drive transformation. Register now at elive.elusian.com. This conference is going to be epic. By now, you've heard me talk about Insights EDU in Phoenix, Arizona, February 20 through 22nd. Here's why I think you should join us at the Insights EDU conference. It's one of the few conferences focused on helping schools serve today's online and non-traditional students. If you're concerned at all about where your enrollments are going to come from in 2024 and beyond, and you should be concerned, you need to be at this conference. Register now at insightsedu.com and use promo code EDUP to save $50. Prepare to be astonished. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to EDUP on the EDUP Experience Podcast, where we make education your business. This is your special guest co-host, Jeffrey M. Roach, and I'm excited to be here with you as we EDUP. I'm so excited to have with us our guest co-host as well. Amardeep Colon is a recognized leader in competency-based ed, workforce development, distance education, adult ed, and pretty much everything higher education. Amardeep is the is a is a vice president at Paradise Valley Community College. Amardeep, it's so wonderful to have you here with us. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's great to be here with you and Paulette today. Thanks again. And um, also, we, Amardeep and I are so excited to have with us uh, truly a transformational leader and, and uh, Paulette Granberry russell president of the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education. Paulette, thank you for being here and give us a, give us a, a little bit of what you do and how you do it. Oh, well, thank you. And it is my pleasure to be here among colleagues that I know value the work of higher education. Let me begin there. And uh, again, the name is Paulette Granberry Russell. I'm the president of the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education, uh, shortened to NADAHI. And I have been the president of the organization since uh, I was elected in uh, 2020. And uh, I was reelected after my first two year term. And so uh, I will remain as president until March of 2024. And uh, it has been a pure uh, joy. Uh, although we've had some challenging times since I began president, members, uh, NADAHI is a membership organization. We have about 2,200 members uh, in the category of institutional members as well as individual members. Uh, we, among our membership, we also include uh, institutions um, more globally, uh, including uh, from the United Kingdom, other places in Europe, as well as uh, Israel. And um, we've been very active, certainly over the years, uh, we were incorporated in 2007, so we're kind of new in the higher education association world, uh, but not new to the work of advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion in higher education. And that's what our membership does. Many of them are senior diversity officers or often referred to as chief diversity officers, as well as diversity practitioners, uh, scholars, researchers, particularly those with an emphasis on uh, diversity issues in higher education. So that is that is the shorthand version of who we are and what we do. Thank you for thank you for sharing that. And obviously, as we delve into this discussion today, we'll, we'll kind of dig a little bit deeper, you know, particularly around not just the work that you do, but but the time we're in. Uh, because to your point, you're you're leading at a very interesting time, but but also really an important element to remember that this is this work has been like this really forever. Uh, exactly. when we really talk about it. And so, Amardeep, I want to give you the first question. So, uh, Paulette, I'm going to ask you about um, diversity. Diversity is uh, more than just a word to me. It's it's a practice that all colleges put into the very fabric of everything that they do. 
And around the country, we are seeing um, there are states, there are colleges moving away from this and shying away from this. And as it is, diversity offices are underfunded, as you know, um, there's a report that came out that many CDOs are under-resourced, underfunded. Where do you see this going? Where do you see this landscape going? And, and where do you see a solution to this? Mm. Why, that is... Uh, it's a big question, but let, let's see where I can begin. Uh, first, and, and I absolutely agree with you that, um, you know, diversity as a, as a, as a word uh, and diversity, equity, and inclusion, which has now become weaponized when we talk about DEI, which uh, as I've made many people aware of over the last year, I don't use the acronym DEI because of the way it has been demonized. Uh, so my belief, I think, which is shared by you is that we really are talking about three very different concepts, principles, values. So when we talk about diversity, uh, I often refer back to certainly one that we have in Nadahi, but I also use one that has been uh, provide it through the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, which is diversity being the fair representation, fair representation of different aspects of human characteristics, identities, and perspectives in the composition of a group. And again, that's just the word diversity, you know, and, and it, you know, the National Academies goes on to define both equity and inclusion, but I, I think in the context of where we are going uh, in the midst of these efforts to dismantle uh, within higher education, diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think both as values as well as programs and policies and practices, um, the one thing that we should never lose sight of is the fact that our campuses are diverse and they will continue to be diverse. And it is the work that we will do with respect to valuing as well as understanding the needs of a diverse campus community, which is uh, certainly um, our students, but we're also talking about our faculty, our staff. We have to acknowledge our alums. We have to acknowledge our donors. We have to acknowledge the broader community that our campuses exist within as well. And so, um, where we're heading uh, is one, a, a place where I think we have to acknowledge and honor the diversity that will be um, recognized on our campuses and living and learning on our campuses, but also the fact that uh, regardless of these efforts to silence voices of that represent different perspectives uh, and lived experiences, that we as an, as an entity in higher education, as an institution in this country, we're gonna to have to respond to the needs of a diverse constituency. And, and how we do that, I think, is what is currently in dispute. That's very insightful and, and a really important question and an and element of how you are approaching it. I wanna ask you, you know, with the Supreme Court ruling, on affirmative action, there's been a lot of misinterpretation uh, in some communities around this issue of diversity, equity, inclusion, yeah. and belonging. Some organizations, even in higher ed, have started to say, well, we got to be really careful. Um, but the reality of it is, is even if you read it, it does not in any way uh, or should not in any way be perceived as taking um, a step back in this work, it should actually right. encourage people to take even more steps forward. Right. And so I want to ask you, you know, as you look at this as an expert, um, what do higher ed leaders, presidents, trustees need to be thinking about, particularly as they think through this recent decision, but to ensure that we're still creating a sense of belonging and community for all voices going forward? in what we all know to be the learning laboratory. And I will say the future belongs in education. And so if we don't do it now, when will we? Well, and it's, let's let's think about this in, in a couple of ways. Um, obviously, 
I think that, um, and and this is clearly a position that Nadahi has taken and one that I've articulated over the last almost year now since the intensity around the dismantling efforts arose. I mean, it's 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 a framework that's being used. It's a framework that's being modeled um, across the country in states where legislation is being introduced. And one of the, what I call the, the four pillars of the dismantling efforts includes uh, what I think is the end result of the Supreme Court decision in June of, of uh, this past summer, 2023. And that pillar includes what is uh, identified as the elimination of preferential treatment in admissions, which, you know, on its basis is disingenuous in terms of uh, the, the way in which higher education approaches admissions. Preferential treatment um, suggests that individuals are being preferred over others on the basis of their race. And that clearly was not the case. Um, certainly not in the place, and, and certain, that's a position that we take as an organization and others will dispute that. But certainly that was not the case in Harvard and it was not the case at the University of North Carolina. And we have to remind people to be clear that that case uh, where the Supreme Court basically found that the approaches being taken were unconstitutional and therefore um, unlawful in the context of the, the processes that were being used, they did acknowledge that um, there's no denying that race uh, impacts the lived experiences of our students. And, and so the court itself acknowledged that there are times when one can uh, utilize the lived experiences of students if that information is shared with the um, admissions office, for example, as a, as a way in which to uh, give some acknowledgement uh, of those experiences based on race. Now, you know, how all of this will play out, we'll have to wait and, and see. But I think for us, when I, I think about the, the successes that we've had over the last 50, 60, 70 years is nothing compared to the inequities that resulted from, you know, for some hundreds of years of neglect and discrimination. And, and so while it was, the Supreme Court decision was discouraging, um, you know, we have to remind people that let's not overextend that decision um, to the broader work that must be done in higher education. So right now we are, I think those of us who define ourselves as experts in the field or those who are practitioners in the field are beginning to think through how we apply um, that decision, how we draw from the experiences of at least nine other states that have lived under uh, laws that have banned race conscious admissions practices, um, as well as now having to adjust to some of the broader impacts and um, of legislation in states like Florida and uh, Texas. So, you know, this, this attempt is, I mentioned earlier, the four pillars, banning uh, preferential treatment in the admissions of students, misrepresentation of the work, banning mandatory uh, diversity statements and mandatory diversity training. Um, all of those uh, those three are significant in the context of this broader work that's being done. And the fourth is the dismantling of what they call DEI bureaucracies, uh, like offices that I um, led for 22 years in higher education. I want to ask you a follow-up to that. Yep. Because uh, first of all, let me just say that I applaud you for being uh, speaking out as forcefully as you have. Uh, I was reading an article uh, that you were quoted in not so long ago, where you you referenced uh, your concern with both the private sector and even higher ed uh, leaders at the board level and at the president level and other levels for not speaking out enough against what's occurring in many, many states. 
And um, I applaud you because I know that's not easy. Uh, and the reality of it is, is we need more of it because what you're getting at is, is this is also an attack on education. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, I am so encouraged that our vice president, uh, Kamala Harris has has stated that so eloquently uh, as well. But I want to just ask you as a, as a follow up to that, why do you find there's such a hesitancy to speak out? Because for mm -hmm. for so long, some of these same leaders were speaking out on other things. So why is there such a hesitancy now? Well, let's let's you know, I can speculate because that's that's really all that it would be at this point, because no one has clearly stated the reasons why, as leaders, they're choosing not to speak out at this point in time. But we're let's recognize the fact that these attacks are coming at the state level where too many of our institutions receive uh, state funding. And to the extent that um the possibility of state funding being threatened by legislators who may be sitting in a majority within their House or Senate. I think that can play into uh, some of the hesitancy to uh, speak out. I think uh, certainly for leaders such as our members who are in states right now, there have been 40 bills that have been introduced in 22 states across this country. Um, and likely, you know, more uh, when, you know, the legislative sessions reconvene probably this winter, late winter, uh, January. So the, the threat of uh, whether it's lost funding, the threat of individuals being targeted for the work that they're doing, um, the voluminous data requests that are um, made of the institutions themselves, which can be fairly onerous. Um, and it, it, I think there's a lot of reasons why we may find leaders choosing not to. But I will say this, and, and one, a thank you for acknowledging the work that um, not a he has been doing and, and sometimes through my voice because you know we have to admit I personally I'm not attached to a university in the way that others are um and I think as an organization we can and should speak out on behalf of our members but I think as a result of not a he speaking out specifically against the dismantling efforts of offices as well as work that has been um, useful in increasing diversity among our faculty, staff, students, as well as the way that we respond to that diversity on our campuses. Uh, by speaking out, we're now finding that other organizations and leaders, including presidents of, of colleges, particularly among our community colleges, are speaking up. And I, I want to point out to um, a letter that 62 of us uh, signed on to that was recently published in uh, if it's okay, is it okay to say the magazine that it was covered in? Absolutely. Okay. Diverse Issues in Higher Education uh, on October the 17th. And it was basically a coalition of academic leaders, uh, including Nadhi, that signed the letter indicating our goal to underscore that coalitions uh, with one another, uh, one, we're forming and will continue to build uh, in ways that I think are significant and important. We want more communication. We want more action. We want more coalitions uh, to build among us in higher education, understanding what's at stake. Um, the progress that has been made, which has been incremental in nature, uh, the importance of diversity in a democracy, um, not silencing the voices, not diminishing um, the type of curriculum that can be taught um, and the research that should be done. Acknowledging the role that uh, higher education uh, plays in creating the workforce in a 21st century uh, and into the future and the needs of this country, particularly if we think about it in the context of STEM, uh, STEM being science, technology, engineering, mathematics and medicine. Uh, let me not forget medicine and, and the role that research has played 
in understanding the needs of a diverse country and, and, and globally as well. So that's, that's what's at stake. Uh, and the absence of voices, um, more need to speak out, uh, but we're starting. We're beginning to see the tide turn just a little bit. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not. For a third straight year, the Edup Experience will be recording live at Elusion Live 2024. This year in San Antonio, Texas, April 7th through the 10th, illuminate, innovate, and inspire. That's the framework for the conference. Leaders from institutions around the world will converge at Elusion Live 2024 to discover game-changing technology, share industry insights, and build powerful connections. It's time to explore higher education's greatest opportunities with future-ready ideas, solutions, and best practices designed to drive transformation. You can register now at elive.elucian.com. Epic. Oh, yeah. You've heard me talk about the Insights EDU Conference. Well, let me tell you three reasons why I think everyone listening should join us in Phoenix, Arizona on February 20 through 22nd for Insights EDU. One, it's one of the few conferences focused on helping schools serve today's online and non-traditional students. Two, you can expect a mix of speakers you won't hear anywhere else, including higher ed leaders from Google, LinkedIn, Adobe, and more. And reason three, Insights EDU has an agenda packed with sessions discussing the latest trends in higher ed leadership, marketing, and enrollment management. Register now at insightsedu.com and use promo code EDUP to save $50 off your registration. Oh, yeah. So that's a perfect segue into the question that I had because I want to move a little bit from higher ed into the workplace, into workforce, and you know how closely those are connected. Mm -hmm. The pandemic, I, I've, I've seen on your bio that you are an advocate for gender equity in STEM, which mm -hmm. I am too, and so I really applaud you for doing that work. Um, the pandemic played havoc on that gender equity in STEM. We saw almost a million, more than a million women exit the workforce because they were gonna go look after their families. How can we recover from that? And what can we learn from that to put into place policies, processes, supports in the future so that we don't bleed like that in the future? Yeah. That is an excellent, excellent question. And, and thank you for acknowledging my interest in that area. Uh, let's, let's just talk about um, the impact of the pandemic and um, what it presented us were opportunities uh, to create the kind of flexibility that I think now the workforce for today is insisting upon, demanding, and quite honestly, employers recognize, including higher ed, that we have to do more to accommodate the needs of our workforce. You know, it's interesting for me, I, I can take this issue back to uh, my earlier career, um, and I think back in the 80s when I wasn't with higher ed, but I was uh, in government, and I was one of those early advocates for what we call flexible work schedules. And those flexible work schedules were um, not embraced in the way that they are now. Uh, and and the, the real emphasis behind, certainly back in the 80s, was the need particularly for parents, but particularly women, who were often uh, and recognized even today as the primary caregivers, not only for their children, but also for uh, elders in the family. And so I, I think we have to understand that um, in the absence of us as leaders, um, of workplaces in the absence of us recognizing the needs of the workforce, particularly in this case, because women still are the primary caregivers, uh, but increasingly their partners uh, and men are recognizing that there's real value in broadly acknowledging um, the needs. And so I think um, what this means is that employers, as much as they are resisting um, uh, the need to provide the flexibility in the work environment, um, that I don't see us returning to an era when um, 
these issues weren't addressed. Now, what does that what does that truly mean for women in the workplace? Um, I think that's also um, it's early on in uh, the evolution of this experiment. Uh, because I think it's still regarded as an experiment. It, it's not something that is, um, I think there's more resistance to um, us uh, moving to the, the broad kind of flexibility that families want. Um, but I think increasingly, if there is more research that can be done, to speak to the benefits of having this kind of flexibility for women, because there's some early research that I was reading and I, and I wish I could just recall um, who authored it, but it was basically demonstrating that in fact, productivity uh, has increased, particularly among women, um, based on their having uh, the ability to work remotely. And I'm sorry, I can't remember. It was just, you know, had I known I was going to be asked that question, I probably would have held on to it. Uh, but I found it to be an interesting read. So thank you for asking the question. I'll have to go back and locate that research. But it's just the beginning of the research. But I think to the extent that we have those kind of positive outcomes, um, that's convincing evidence to employers that, uh, you know, slow down just a little bit and think about uh, the benefits, not only to the individuals that need this kind of flexibility, but what they're producing for you. So I'd like to ask you a quick follow-up question to that. So um, the I, I've done a lot of work with women in tech. Um, I used to lead the women in tech program at mm -hmm. my college earlier. And um, how can employers work with institutions of higher ed to create those pipelines to bring more females into the world and assure them of these supports that you're talking about, these yeah. processes? Thank you for that excellent response, by the way. That was um, that was really good. <laughs> well, let's let me talk a little bit about um, creating a pipeline. We're not going to be able to create a pipeline if some of these dismantling efforts uh, are increasingly successful. Um, and when I talk about pipeline programs, uh, pathway programs, uh, depending on the terminology that's being utilized, um, we're really talking about at what stage do we begin to interest girls in STEM, in technology? And we cannot ignore the fact that historically, girls and women were discouraged from pursuing engineering, science, mathematics, um, and even medicine. Uh, although increasingly, um, we're finding some shifts in the context of medicine. But that's certainly not the case in engineering. That's certainly not the case in some of the uh, STEM, certainly in physics, if I think about that as one where I've, I've spent quite a bit of my time uh, over the last eight or nine years. Um, so pipeline pathway programs are essential. Introducing girls to uh, STEM fields early on, cultivating that interest, nurturing their um, excitement, curiosity, uh, is important at a very early age. And to the extent that there are now challenges by organizations um, with respect to our pathway programs and utilizing those programs to increase participation of girls and women in STEM is problematic. Now, the way to address that, of course, has been by ensuring that those programs are broadly inclusive, meaning we're not going to, if a boy wants to participate in a pathway program that is intended to increase the participation of girls and women in STEM, so be it. There's a lot that can be learned um, for him being in the midst of a diverse um, environment like that. And, and so, you know, and my belief is by demonstrating um, to individuals early in their life, uh, ways in which bias can impact the experiences of others 
that allows them, unfortunately, to drop out of that experience later because of the hurdles that they have to go through to feel a sense of belonging and welcome. I, I, my, my view is the broader the diversity that participates and understands these issues, the better for all of us in the long run. And so for me, it has been uh, creating the pathways, um, building the academic and social supports for young women, um, or certainly those who identify as female in higher education, using uh, the research, evidence-based research that we now know in forms of about what the experiences are uh, for women in STEM um, so that we can address those and begin to dismantle. Th that's where we need to begin to dismantle those barriers to participation as well as the outcomes that we need. So long way to answer your question, but uh, that was a big question. No, thank you. Thank you for answering that. I just want to add one thing here before I turn it back to Jeffrey is that um, it's an old piece of work, but unlocking the clubhouse with Margolis and Fisher talks okay. exactly about that, how young girls, even as young as fifth grade, get discouraged from these fields by the entire ecosystem around them. Yes. You know, That's, so thank yeah. you. Thank you for that amazing. Oh, you're welcome. And I'm just going to give a plug to uh, Title IX, uh, if I can, because I think for me, again, I, I remind people I'm a baby bloomer. So I, I was in high school uh, in 72. And one of the things that I wanted to do was pole vault. And I went to the coach who happened to be male and uh, told him I wanted to pole vault. Well, they didn't have pole vaulting for girls at the time. Um, but what I was told is that I couldn't pole vault because I didn't have girls didn't have upper body strength. And then what I tell folks is um, in 2012, 2012, my daughter um, uh, qualified for state, regional and state for pole vaulting. So you cannot tell me that girls do not have upper body strength. They do. It's just that our interest wasn't nurtured um, and uh, we were discouraged from participating. Uh, fortunately, that's not uh, the same kind of constraints today. But there, there are other barriers and hurdles that are out there. So we're just going to keep fighting them uh, and resisting them as much as we can. Well, and I want to um, go back to uh, an important topic, and this will be the last question uh, based on time. But I want to just ask you to speak to this. Um, what what I think oftentimes is not getting covered is the impact of students uh, mm -hmm. when we talk about. Uh, what's occurring on on this really important issue of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in higher education and in industry? We're dealing with a time where mental health uh, is really the number one medical issue facing our nation, but also the globe. Mm -hmm. um, as we know, many students that come from various different backgrounds are predisposed to actually facing mental health issues more than others, mm -hmm. um, particularly. Uh, students that happen to be in the LGBTQ plus community. Yeah. Yet many are in schools uh, where states are basically telling them you don't exist. I want to mm -hmm. just ask you to speak to why we as higher education leaders and industry leaders need to keep this in mind because our voices and our words matter. Um, and if we don't take the right steps, uh, we're actually hurting our, not our current, but our future generations uh, in pretty significant ways, which I think is just absolutely despicable and, yeah. and disheartening. Well, and and along with being despicable and disheartening, it is cruel. Um, and and I think about um, the impact that this is having on our students. Um, you know, students broadly, but certainly to the extent that these dismantling efforts are clearly intended to impact the lived experiences of students within the LGBTQ plus community, specifically um, by dismissing gender affirming care, uh, curriculum, uh, social supports, academic supports, uh, creating a very hostile environment for these students um, by these proclamations of their unworthiness 
um, and trying to take us back to an era where the voices of those students were silenced in their existence was not to be acknowledged. There can be nothing more despicable or cruel than that. Um, and from my perspective, you know, it's it's interesting when you look at the carve outs in the legislation that is being introduced. And I have to remind people of this because basically, you know, if you're Pell eligible, that's that's cool. If you're first gen, that's okay. If you're a veteran, that's good. If you are, um, let's see, a person with a disability, veterans, uh, Pell, first gen, all of those things have been carved out of the legislation and said, those are permissible because they're race neutral and they are, in this instance, um, gender, gender identity neutral, all right? And um, I think there's an acknowledgement that you must um, abide by our non-discrimination laws, which includes disabilities. Um, and so, and, and you can't discriminate Okay, and, and by meaning you can't discriminate, what what does that really look like in these spaces? Um, and, and I think if I reflect back on what, how narrowly um, and how difficult the law makes it for us to be able to prove discrimination based on what I'll call a protected characteristic, which is true for gender, which is true for race, which is true for disability, um, it's on the one hand, it's okay to acknowledge an individual who may include within their uh, intersecting identities their uh, their um, identifying as lesbian or trans, but you can't provide social supports or academic supports that might provide differential opportunity experiences for them. You can't acknowledge that. Um, to me, that's that's a huge failing. It's 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 almost embarrassing that in this country today that we're even having this conversation. Um, and so, for me, it's it's interesting the ways in which they've carved out what's permissible and acceptable and what's not. So yeah. we're we're moving back in time where race is of no consequence. Now, of no consequence doesn't mean that we are not going to uh, ever experience discrimination, you know, that your gender identity is of no consequence. And therefore, you don't have to worry that somehow your experiences are going to be different based on your gender identity. Well, that's we're not there yet. OK, when we get there, we'll know it. But we know we're not there yet right now. And so. um Obviously, as you can tell, I feel very strongly about that. And uh, for organizations like Nadahi, we're going to continue uh, with our voice in opposition to these efforts. Uh, and fortunately, we are finding that more voices within higher ed and outside of higher ed are beginning to join us. So um, I remain hopeful. It's It's been hard, uh, but I remain hopeful. I'm beginning to see more coalitions forming and more resistance to these efforts. Well, thank you for that. And I want to ask you um, anything that you want to add that you did not get a chance to share uh, in this conversation, as well as the last question uh, that all of our guests get is what is the future of higher education based on your based on your expertise? Hmm. Well, nothing in terms of what you if there's anything more that I can ask, answer, um, you know, if, if there's anything I want to say is we will persist. Uh, and we will continue to resist uh, these efforts. Uh, and, and the future, uh, I think what the future holds uh, will be dependent on uh, voices and broader uh, understanding of what is at stake. And that understanding has to extend beyond higher education. It must extend into our broader communities outside higher education. It's not just K through 20 that um, will be uh, struggling as a result of these efforts. Um, it is this country uh, as well as uh, what we produce as a country in the context of our, our students um, once they leave our campus communities and the work that they do. Thank you for that. And and let me just uh, 
also take this opportunity uh, to outro our guest co-host, uh, Amardeep Cologne. And, and before I officially outro her, I just need to also be one of the first in the EdUp community uh, to recognize and congratulate her on the public announcement of her being the first Vice President of Education and Learning at the Central New Mexico Community College. Uh, congratulations, Amardeep, on such an amazing opportunity, but it also speaks to your accomplishments and your legacy of uh, being a transformational leader in the higher education space. So congratulations. Thank you. So uh, Tracy Hartzler, the president there, was on the EdUp experience in January. Absolutely. So. And she was quoted, I believe, actually, yeah. several times. Yeah, yeah, she's amazing. Uh, well, Paulette, it's been awesome listening to you. And I have to admit, I didn't know much about this organization at all before I got the invite to co-host and did a lot of research. It's amazing what you're doing. And as long as we have organizations like yours, like people like you, I think we're going to be okay. Thank you both so much. And I wish you all the best. And, and again, congratulations on Thank your new you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, also, I just want to uh, also outro our amazing guest, Paulette Granberry Russell, president of the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education. Paulette, it has truly been a privilege to have you here on EdUp uh, as part of this experience. Uh, we know that all of our listeners, as well as every leader in higher education, uh, faculty, staff that have a chance to listen to this will be transformed. Uh, your leadership, your words uh, do truly matter. And I love the fact that you said we will persist um, because the entire EdUp community will persist with you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to just say for all of our guests, you have just been EdUp. Uh, again, thank you so much uh, to each uh, and every one of you for all that you do within the EdUp experience. And thanks for the all that you do in higher education. It's our privilege. Thanks again. Attention. It's time to register for Elusian Live 2024, April 7th through 10th in San Antonio, Texas. Illuminate, innovate, inspire, explore higher education's greatest opportunities with future ready ideas, solutions, and best practices designed to drive transformation. Register now at elive.elusian.com. This conference is going to be epic. Hey there, higher ed leaders. Are you thinking about joining the EdUp Experience podcast at Insights EDU on February 20th through 22nd in Phoenix, Arizona? 100%. I thought so. This is the go-to event for higher education marketing and enrollment management. At Insights EDU, you'll gain cutting edge insights from industry experts, including speakers from companies like Google, LinkedIn, Adobe, Salesforce, and more. Become the transformational leader your campus needs by participating in discussions on important topics like online student demands and preferences, increasing affordability and accessibility, branding, measuring marketing performance, and much more. Insights EDU is the conference you need to attend in 2024. Register now at insightsedu.com and use the code EDUP to save $50 off your registration.